Come on, if God's done anything good in your life, if you're not who you used to be, talk like how you used to talk, walk like how you used to walk. Come on, if God's healed you, if God's touched you, if God saved you, come on, if your husband's different, if your kids are different, if you see yourself different, come on, if you got a reason to be thankful, can we give God tonight a loud, audacious shout of praise? Come on, take a moment. Just take a moment. Just stay here for a second. Thank you. So good. He's so good. Why don't you turn to a couple neighbors and hug on them. Let them know how good you look. Let them know how good they look. Get comfortable. It is, uh, it is such an honor. It's such an honor to be back uh, with family. Like, you have no idea. How many of you have been here when I've been here before? I just want to see how many of the people. Oh, I love you guys. Love you guys. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm that strange uncle uh, that comes around during the holidays, you know, and, like, eats the food, and you haven't seen him for a minute, you know? Like, that's that, that strange uncle. But it is, uh, it is such a privilege uh, to be with each and every one of you, to be back at this church. I was here like, I was, I was driving with Aaron, who's uh, new to the church. He's on team six, seven months now. And I was like, hey, let me tell you about the church you're a part of. And I was like, I was here in the community center when it was three services and about 1,200 people. And then I came back, and then it was five services and a couple thousand people. And then I remember when I wrote, like, a thousand letters so that we could help secure this building. I didn't write, I didn't write any letters. They did. And, the, and then came here when the church opened. And then we celebrated 20 years this year. Come on, somebody. And, and what I've learned is that healthy churches are a reflection of healthy leaders. And I'm just letting you know, you are a part of a vibrant, alive, healthy church. And that's because you have leaders that are vibrant and alive and healthy leaders with a healthy marriage and a healthy family. And none of us would be in the room if it wasn't for some people that said 20 years ago, we're going to give everything to this region and build a safe place for people to find Christ and, of course, find what? Hope and healing. And can we just give it up for your pastors, Pastor Sean and Diana. Thank you for the way you lead. Thank you for the way you love. Thank you for the way you innovate. Thank you for being literally some of my best friends, me and my wife's best friends in the entire world. And as the song said, ba 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 baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. We love you guys. We love you guys. And uh, I think my wife's watching, and uh, I don't show pictures of her anymore because she's really attractive, and I don't want people to be jealous, you know? So I just, I stopped showing the photos because uh, God's been really good to me, but I uh, married 18 years this year. I believe she's watching online. I got four... Uh, beautiful kids, one girl, three boys, 12, 9, 6, and 3. My three-year-old's not saved yet. He has not made a decision for Jesus. And uh, I'm not joking. He's not, I don't know, you know, like we're just, I'm trying. He doesn't want to repeat the prayer. Um, he's not participating yet, you know, so pay for Grace and Graham. And um, it means a lot for me to be here. I'll tell you in this season of my life why this is so significant for me uh, and probably maybe be different and maybe a little more raw than I've been in the past is um, a couple years ago, I felt God say, hey, you need to try to give your families the weekend again. I was traveling a lot, as um, Pastor Sean knows and Diana knows, I was traveling in like 40 weekends a year and basically being gone four months a year when I added it up. Now, I offset it with a lot of rewards for my kids and don't want you to think I was an abusive husband and I wanted to leave. I didn't want to leave. I was just being obedient. But when you leave every weekend, like, you don't have any weekends. Like, I was like, what's Saturday? Like, I'm flying on Saturday. I'm preaching on Sunday. And I felt God say, hey, I want you to focus on some other stuff and give your families a weekend. So right now, and last time I was here, it was the same thing. I only go to about five places a year to do this. And maybe we'll take a few extra uh, things that I think God's done. So this is one of my five. And it is an honor. I told Pastor Sean, if I just get to come back here every year and be a part of building this great house and serving these families, uh, it, it, means, it, it means so much to me. And um, just want to thank you guys for allowing me to share. And, and because of the rawness and season I am, and, and I don't have these moments often, I got about five hours of content. Like I have 22. I don't know if you knew. It was second Wednesday and third Wednesday and fourth Wednesday all in one. 
So I got about 22 messages. We got You should see a few of your faces, by the way. Like, apparently you don't like the word. Because when I said it, a few were like, don't, not, wrong night. Like, it's not the old school temp meeting. Uh, no, it, it just means that I'm very aware that we are sharing the same measuring metrics of mankind called time. We're, we're actually about to have a, a crazy spiritual human experience that we're never going to get back. And as I was driving here, I was just reminded that before God ever placed the star in the sky or gave birds the ability to fly, God saw this moment. God saw each and every one of you and handpicked us to have a divine design collision with destiny tonight. And and just so each of you guys know, for those of you who don't know me, like when you're starting a new relationship, you kind of got to like establish like your intentions with this relationship, right? Like... If you're single and you're dating, you know, like, what's your intentions here? If you, you're a mom or a dad and someone's dating your kids, right? What are you like? What's your intentions with my daughter? You know, as Pastor Sean would say. What's your intentions here? You know, and I just want you to be very clear. I want to be very clear with each and every one what my intentions are with this moment we're going to share together tonight. My intention is that you live the best life that God divinely designed you to live. My intentions tonight is that you would experience the more of God. My intentions for you tonight is that any area that's holding you back, any hindrance, any bondage, any struggle that you're walking through, any miracle that you need would take place tonight. If you don't wanna know what my intentions are tonight, my intentions are this would not be a service that simply comes and go, a moment that we live in and walk away from, but this would be a moment that changes your life forever. My intentions is this would be a date you remember for the rest of your lives and you talk to your kids about and your children's children about. My intentions tonight is that the thing you've been looking for, you find. That the doors you've been knocking on would be open. That the miracle you need would take place. My intentions are that you would experience God. I'm sorry if I'm getting excited. It's early. My intentions are that you would have a moment with God you've never had before. That he would overwhelm you. That he would envelop you. That he would encounter you. My intentions are that this message would move you from chaos to clarity. My intentions are that anxiety would disappear and, 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 and destruction and despair that you're feeling would leave your body. My intentions are that you'd have the best sleep of your night, that you would wake up feeling joy you've never had before. My intentions are that I would do everything I can to get out of the way so that God can come in on full display and give you the very thing you are alive for and while you're on the planet, my intentions are is that you would win in every way, shape, or for, my intentions are I want you to win more than I want myself to win, that's my intention, and I would do anything I could if I knew you to get something out of the way that's keeping you from what God wants you to have. This is my intention, you can get a seat because we got a long way to go, but thank you. My intentions can't stand the whole time. Maybe, I don't know. My intentions are, my intentions are is that we would have a raw, honest moment. I'm gonna let you know for the few minutes we're going to share together and I we might never get these minutes back might not have the ability to do this again like my intentions are but I'm going to open my heart and you would open your heart my intentions are that that we would be extremely honest with the stuff that's going on in our heads and going on in our homes and going on in our hearts that we're not talking about but we're worried about it would be my desire that we could just Set aside the clutter for a moment and the facade for a moment and the image we're projecting right now and portraying right now. And some of you, your image looks great and you look beautiful and you got it together and you did it. But I'm so aware as I've now on my 40, turning 41 next month, journey of life that although we had an epic worship experience and had a powerful exchange, remembering what God did on the cross through communion, I'm also very aware that for Many of us in the room, we're not all on a mountaintop. I'm just so aware as I've spent so much time with humanity that there's people in the room tonight that actually are very hurting, extremely worried, overwhelmed with anxiety, overwhelmed with shame, wrestling with fear, afraid of what tomorrow might bring or what someone might find out. I'm just being honest. I'm just aware that many people, although you love Jesus and you're trying, you you find yourself in a moment in life, if I can just be honest, a situation of life, a, a season of life where it's not turning out the way you wanted it to. Just being honest. I, I don't know who you are and I'm not gonna 
call you out, but what I sense is there's people in this room, you could be sitting here and you know, maybe you were married before and you, you got divorced or you lost your spouse and you're stuck at home with some kids and you really would love a companion. And if you're being honest, the question that's going on in the back of your mind that you're starting to ask yourself is, is this it? Is, is, is this loneliness and raising kids alone and living in isolation and not having that joy of love or, or romance or the right person, is this it? Is this all that my, my life's going to be? Maybe you grew up in poverty and you're experiencing it today and you're stuck on welfare and you're living from food stamp to food stamp, but you want to get out of debt and you want to know financial freedom, but you've started to ask yourself the questions I'm not getting the job, I'm not getting the raise, I, I'm stuck in what my grandparents were stuck in and what my parents are stuck in, and am I just gonna be like them? Is this it? Is this all my, my life is going to be? Maybe you're here tonight and, and you've been dealing with something, a struggle, an addiction, and can I just tell you something for a second, church? People that are addicted didn't always wanna be addicted. So I want to help you know that. Not everyone's like, you know what I want to do? Be addicted to a substance or be addicted to a screen or be addicted to approval or, or be addicted to resentment or unforgiveness because that's also an addiction. There's many people that find themselves in a habitual process that never said, this is what I want. But they're a product of their environment and one decision led to another decision and then they got stuck and the enemy got a hold and you come into church and you're saying the prayers but you're still dealing with it. And you've asked yourself, is this just what my life's going to be like? Is this it? Is this, is this going to be the cycle? Is this going to be every season? Is this it? Is this all that my life is going to be? Maybe you're married and you're so pumped to get married and you're like, I wanted to have some kids and then you had a miscarriage and then you had another miscarriage and then the doctor says, I don't know if you're going to have a kid and you're sitting here like, let's just be honest. I don't got time to play games. You're sitting at home and you're starting to scratch your head and saying, God, what's going on? Is, are we gonna be barren? Are we never gonna produce? Is my dream never gonna come true? Is this it? Is this all that my life's gonna be? Maybe you're sitting here and you're a creative or you're an artist or you have a skill set or a gifting or you're, you're an innovator or you're an inventor or you're an entrepreneur, but no one else knows it. No one's seen the gift. No one's recognized it. No one's tapped it. And you're sitting there saying, am I just going to live with something inside that never comes out? Am I going to always feel like I don't fit in the room and find my place in this world? And is this, is this it? Is this all? Who am I talking to? Is this, is this all that my, my life's going to be? Or, or to be honest, maybe you're just crushing. Maybe it's a season of success. And you got the house and you got the picket fences and you got the title and you got the cars and you got the J's and, and you're empty. Because everyone knows when you get to a mountaintop without God, you get there alone. Which is why the friends that I have that have so much influence and affluence that literally don't know Jesus are so empty and so, look at every celebrity out there that doesn't have God. Why suicide? Why drugs? Why affairs? Because they've gotten everything the world can offer. Friend, you want to know the greatest form of depravity? It's not having nothing and hoping you have something. It's having everything the world can offer and still being empty. And maybe you got the best the world could give you and you're going, is this... The money's not enough, the title's not enough, the faith, the followers aren't enough. Is this, is this it? Is this all that my life is going to be? Maybe you're 35 and you've been single and ready to mingle for a minute, guy or girl, and your friends are getting married and your younger friends are getting married. That's when you know you really get upset. You're like, I'm 35, she's 23, she can wait. I'm ready, I'm good, that girl's got time, I do not. <laughs> and you're sitting there going, is this, it, 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 am I gonna settle just so I have someone? Is this it, is this all that my life is gonna be? Maybe you thought that job was gonna open up or you were gonna 
get the thing you very needed or maybe you're an athlete that you thought you were gonna make it to the next level, high school to college or college to pros and you didn't get picked up, you didn't make the draft, no one recognized you, you didn't get the scholarship to go and you're now going, what am I settling for? I thought this is who I was but this is what I am now and is this, is this it? Is this all my life is going to be? Is this, is this what I'm here for? And the good news is, I'll tell you, the good news is, is that if you're asking that question, it's still a question. It would be so drastically different if you were saying, this is it, exclamation point, versus is this it, question mark. It's different when you start saying, this is final, this is it. I will be broke, I will be lonely, I will be addicted. I will be overlooked. I will never have it. But this room's here today going, this isn't it. See, you have a question mark going, is this it? But there's something inside of you that says, no, 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 this can't be it. There's got to be more. There's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be more than just nine to fives. There's got to be more than just going to weddings and baptizing babies and attending funerals. There's got to be more than just breathing air and paying taxes and dying. There's got to be more than just the average. There's got to be more than just the mundane. There's got to be more than just the status quo. Come on, is there anyone in here that although you've been asking the question, there's something inside of you saying, this is not it. There's got to be more to this life for me. And, and even if you've never been in an environment like this and didn't expect a white boy to get all the veins out and start yelling this soon and you're looking at your friend saying, why did you bring me? Like, what happened? Like, I, like, like even if that's you and you just came in and this is the first time in an environment like that and first of all, thank you for coming and taking the risk and checking it out and trying. And the reason why you're here and you're still saying this isn't it is because the Bible tells us that God placed eternity in the hearts of every man and woman. He actually put this code inside of you that says earth is not it. This is not final. Mundane is not your goal. That, that, that the, the basic is not my desire for you. There's something inside of every one of us. That's why you're here searching. That's why you're looking because you've looked throughout the world and looked throughout the land and you've looked for every opportunity and something said there's gotta be more. To this life than this. There's got to be more to this life than this. And the reason why there's more is because you and I were made with more in mind. You need to understand this. You were handcrafted, carved out through eternity with more in mind. You were made with more in mind and you were made for more. Now, for those of you who don't know this biblical narrative of how this whole thing got started, let me just give you a little context. And if you think you know it, please don't tune out. I'll tell you, you're going to learn some stuff you did not know. But the Bible tells us that at some point in the journey of history, before humanity was created, before the world was built the way that we know it, there, there was this battle in heaven. There was this angel called Lucifer. He was this anointed cherub, and he would awaken the angels and the angelic host. And one day, in Isaiah 14, actually gives us insight into this. One day he said, you know what? I'm going to make my throne like God's. And you can put the scripture on, but I'm going to paraphrase. I'm going to make my throne like God. He said, I'm actually going to ascend to, ascend to the mountaintops. And Isaiah documents how he was cast down to earth. And th this verse ends with him saying, you know what? I want to be like God. That's what the verse, just go to Isaiah 14 quickly. I want to show that. He says, I'm going to make myself like the most Hi, Lucifer at some point said, I want to make myself like God. Now, that word like means to resemble or to carry the image of. So at some point, he's in heaven, and pride gets introduced, and he goes, you know what? I want to be God. I want to be like God. I want to carry the image of God. I want to resemble God. I want to have the essence of God. And then there's this battle that breaks out in heaven. And make no mistake, God and the devil have never been fighting. I just need you to get this. Everyone's like, oh, it was a vicious battle. God almost lose. But in the 12th round, like, knock, he came back, Adrian. Like, that's not what happened. Like, the angels were fighting each other because God has no equal. God has no rival. The enemy and the devil and God are not on the same page. They're not on the same plane. They don't even exist in the same context. They were fighting. God sets up and he says, you know what? That's enough. You want to be like me? I'm going to cast you down to earth as punishment. You need to get this. 
The enemy was not sent to this planet so that it would be his playground or his paradise. He was sent here, is stuck here, and resides here because this is his place of punishment. And then the Bible tells us in Genesis 1, and you need to do your own biblical diligence, the Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and his spirit began to hover over the waters. Like, you got to imagine these angels who are now fallen demons, they woke up around the presence of God every day. They never knew what it was like to be disconnected from God's presence, from his essence, from his aura, from his power. And now they're cast down to this earth, which is defined as a dry, chaotic wasteland. The Bible says it was formless and void. And then the spirit begins to hover the waters. And if you just got to, like, imagine those demons back then, they got to be like, wait a second, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And then God said, let there be light. And he turned the switches on, and he scattered like cockroaches. And that was day one. And then t- day two, he goes, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to separate the, the waters from the heaven, from the waters of the earth, and I'm going to create the sky. And, and that was day Two, and then day three, he goes, you know what, let's separate the water here and and put the ground here, and then this ground's gonna bear forth seeds and vegetations and fruit. And he begins to, now I just want you to understand, this entire time, the reason why I'm going through this creation story, like, yeah, we could do this easier with a flannel graph, makes a lot more sense. The reason why I'm going through this creation story is because the devil occupied this planet chaotic and void and formless and full of waste, and he did nothing with it. He built nothing, he created nothing, he established nothing, he just occupied the dirt. And as God begins to go, you know what, here's some trees and here's some bees and here's some animals and here's some vegetation. Every aspect of creation is a constant reminder to the enemy of what he could never do unless God got involved. That's why he hates creation. He's against creation because the mountaintops and the molehills, the raindrops and the oceans, every bit of this thing is a constant reminder to them of what you could not do with the dirt that God assigned you to. Would also let you know that the devil has no creative ability. Do you know that? The devil creates nothing new. He only can distort what's already been created. Which is why every great lie is filled with a little truth. Because he can only distort truth, he can't even originate a new lie. Because he has absolute, he did nothing with the dirt, and we don't know how long it was stuck here. And then day four comes, and what's so cool about God, and some of you know this, he goes, you know what? Uh, let's put the sun up and the moon up and get some stars out there. It's going to be epic. Let's create time. Just so you know, there's no time in eternity. Time was created. There's no time in eternity. There's no beginning, no end. He created time to limit this earthly experience. So don't ever let time say it's too late or you've missed your moment. Like don't ever let this earthly limitation called time reduce your eternal revelation of what you can do. But here's what's, here's what's so cool. I'm having fun. I hope you are. Here's, what, here's what's so cool. He said, let the relate on day one, but he never created the scientific source of light until day four. Yeah, he's a gangster. He lit it. He literally was just like, you know what? I am light. I don't need sun for there to be light. I don't need stars for there to be light. I don't need the moon for there to be light. I am the original source of light. But just so scientists don't lose their mind, I'm also going to help create the sun so they can make sense of it being bright every single day because I'm the source of light. I would also like to point out, isn't the creation story so much like our salvation story? Before the Holy Spirit comes into your life, Your life is this dry, chaotic, let's be honest. You knew what she was like before Jesus. He was like before Jesus. Your kids were like before Jesus. It was chaotic. It was formless. It was void. It had no rhyme or reason. It had no sense or season. That's what it was. And then God shows up. His spirit's coming. He goes, you know what? Let me turn the lights on in your life. Let me separate the waters here. Let me create dry land. Hey, you're going to start bearing fruit here. You're going to start multiplying here. Our creation story is our salvation story. But this is not even the best part. The best part is when he gets to day six. Genesis 1, 26. And now, remember why the enemy is occupying space on this planet in the first place. Isaiah 14 said he wanted to be like God. He wanted to carry the image of God. He wanted to resemble God. He wanted to be like God without God. God knows this. And he begins to take the very fabric of the world he could do nothing with. The essence that he's stuck in, the dirt, rolling around with, 
wandering in, he takes the very thing the enemy could make nothing out of. He begins to form this thing. Good biceps, you know, it's like six pack. Like, begins to form this thing. And this is where it gets gangster. And I'm just telling you, when I say what I'm gonna say next, because I know where I'm going, I've done this before. What, what, what I say I'm gonna say next, I'm just telling you like the gates of hell shake and shudder. And the enemy cringes because he knows where I'm going. God said, you wanna be like me without me? Cool, I'm gonna take the very fabric of the world you could do nothing with. And I'm gonna say, let us make man in our image. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta admit, if you're the devil, you gotta sit there and be like, what just happened? The thing I wanted to be without you, the thing I fell to this planet, I'm stuck here getting punished for. You're taking very, the very fabric, the essence, the dirt that I've done. You're just taking dirt and you're making it into a man and then you're giving men and women your image. You haven't gotten it yet. I'm gonna help you get there, which means your face on your worst face day when you wake up in the morning exhausted and you hit every branch in the ugly tree on the way down and you're bloated because you pounded some gluten last night and way too much sodium and the acne's just breaking out, like your worst face day, when you crawl out of bed and you got, you know, the Hawaii, we say maka, maka pia pia in the eyes, you know, you got the eye boogers. I don't know what they, you know, eye boogers, that was called. I never thought I'd say that on a service and I just did. Everyone say it to your friends 10 times fast. Just joking. When you take those eye boogers out of your eye, your worst face day, when you crawl yourself out of bed, your face alone is a reminder to the enemy of his greatest defeat. The image you carry every single day reminds the enemy, do you know who I look like? Sometimes I almost wanna look like at the devil like I'm in a scary movie and go, boo. Do you know what this is? Just take a look at this for the second. I represent the very thing you could not have, did not have, and will never have, which is the image of the almighty God resembling who he is every single day. Which is why, ladies and men, why do you think there's been such attack after your image? Why do you think he's literally got you hating your face, cutting your face, carving your face, wishing you look different, hating what you see in the mirror? It's because the devil wants to disconnect you from one of your greatest weapons, your image alone. It's a constant echoing reminder to him of what he could never be, what he will never have. It's your face. And we watch a generation of young people want to look different and hate what they see. He's after your identity because your identity is your victory. Some of you are gonna look at yourself different tonight, different in the morning. Some of yourself are gonna actually love what you see because you're gonna see God in the mirror. You're gonna see the very thing the enemy sees and he's deceiving you from understanding or you use it as a weapon every single day. And then he doesn't speak us into existence. He breathes us into existence. And this is why it's significant, because God's word creates worlds, as I've just laid out through the beginning of the Bible, which means, and you need to get this, when God speaks, that word creates the reality in which the thing can live and the limit in which it can exist. So when God said, let there be a tree, he actually created the reality the essence, the DNA, the makeup in which that tree could live, but it limited what the tree could be because he defined it and confined it as tree, which is why when he said mountain, that mountain will never be seen because he identified it as a mountain. So here's the reality in which a mountain can live, but here's the limit in which it can exist. And when God said crocodile, that crocodile's never gonna be an ape. You wanna know why? Because he called it by its name, so he created the reality in which it could be, but the limit in which it can exist. Which is why monkey, let me help you out, can never be man, because God said, let there be a monkey, and that created the reality in which the monkey could live, but the limit in which it can exist. But when it came to us, he did not wanna limit us. He wanted to give us his very creative nature inside of us, which is why humans create not today, but the future. And he didn't speak us into existence. He breathed us into existence. 
which means the very breath of God is resonating over our vocal cords, coming out of our mouth, declaring what we will see and not see, be or not be, have or not have, which is why he said literally, not hypothetically, the power of life and death is in your tongue, which is why the enemy goes after two things in its church and its people. He goes after your identity, your image, and then he goes after your voice. If I can disconnect you from what you were created in and then shut up how you're gonna create the future, then I'm gonna win the war for this word. Which is why, what are you saying lately? The best thing you could ever do is eliminate anything coming out of your mouth that's never come out of God's. And then God, creating us for more, says, hey, I want you to be fruitful, multiply. Think about it. He created us from nothing, so we're a, a, a living demonstration of more. Yes. Think about it. There was not us. It was dust, and now there's more of us. It's us. Look at this. How crazy is that, right? We're a living, living demonstration of more. And then he looks at the more he created and said, hey, I want you to do more of this. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to subdue the earth. I want you to have dominion over all of it. And this is what he hooks us up for in the beginning. Yeah. And it was the best life. We're walking around naked, eating fruit, naming animals, chilling with God, walking in the garden. It was epic. Until one day the serpent, the most cunning of all creatures, comes up to Eve and says, Did God say you can't eat of the fruits in the garden? And she goes, and it's on the screen. I'm paraphrasing, do your biblical due diligence. She says, uh, no, 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 we can eat from every tree. It's actually like I was just rereading it, preparing. She's like, no, 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 we can eat from all the trees. It's pretty epic, but one. So she says, we just can't eat from that tree. We can't touch it. We'll die. And the devil says to her, right, but will you surely die? Because you won't die. You're going to see things you've never seen before. And then she says, the Bible says, and she was convinced. And in that moment, the God who created mankind for more Watch mankind settle for less. And what you need to know, that is my definition of sin. The definition of sin, for me, what I see through scripture, is settling for less than God's best. It's, uh, the best way to put it is simply missing the mark. God created this divine design, said, here's what I want you to do. And in that moment, we said, uh, we're going to choose us over choosing you. And we settle for less. And then the symptoms of sin called death, destruction, envy, greed, jealousy, malice, sickness, cancer, disease, the symptoms of sin came into the world as a result of us settling for less. Now, some of you are like saying, Jedediah, no, 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 the symptoms of sin are actually sin. Well, sin produces sin. But let me give you a theological supporting fact. The Bible says to him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it's sin. Wait a second. I didn't do bad? Think about it. I didn't do bad? He says, no, no, if you know to do good and you don't do it, like, so if you know you should just open that door for someone and you don't do it, if you know you should just give and you don't do it, if you know you should forgive and you, you don't do it, if you know you're supposed to stop on that side of the road and help them change their tire and you don't do it, now here's what's crazy, you didn't do bad, you just didn't do good. And that's the Bible saying, you know why? Because he says, you know to do good and then you decide to not hit the mark and that's why I'm defining it as a sin. Sin is missing the mark. And we need to have a revelation of sin because we're so caught up in everyone's symptoms of sin, which is a result of all of us missing the mark, that we're more focused on the symptom than the problem. Wow. And the problem is not our habits or our actions or the results. The problem is if we haven't recalibrated our life and showed humanity what the actual mark is. Wow. And the mark is simply living God's best. So we settle for less, we miss the mark, and all of this mess and madness and chaos and calamity and death and destruction and wars and famines as a result of simply us settling for less enter into the world. But the crazy thing about our God and our Savior is although we said we want less, he said, I'm still going to find a way to give you my best. And he worked his way back to humanity. He literally said, I'm going to send my son. You heard it during communion. And Jesus shows up, God with skin on, and he's epic. Yeah. 
He's loving every human being. He's hanging out with the thugs and the crooks and the criminals and the tax collectors. He's got people that you wouldn't touch called leopards. Like he's got everyone around him. He's going to homes that Christians wouldn't go to. He's having relationships with people people wouldn't have a relationship with. He starts healing people. He's like, your eyes should be open and your leper shoe should be healed. And dead don't exist. You should be raised. And let's put some coins in the fish's mouth and let's multiply filet of fish happy meals for everybody. You get 5,000 and you get 5,000. Like he's just going, off and then he literally does some says some crazy stuff he goes listen and see all that I've been doing and the way I've been loving if you believe in me you're gonna do what I've been doing that's what the Bible says and then he says in fact you're gonna do greater things than me because I'm going to my father and whatever you ask in his name I will do and then and then he looks at us and he says and, and by the way I'm gonna go on the cross I'm gonna take back the power of life death in the grave. I'm going to be able to give you eternal life. And I'm going to take these keys of the kingdom and all authority in heaven and earth. And I'm going to actually give it to you. Yeah. And then he says, these signs are going to follow those who believe the dead will be raised and the sick will be healed and blind eyes will be open and the deaf will hear again and the lame will walk and demons will be cast out. <laughs> he, he, I mean, it's the, I'm just telling you, man, I don't, I don't know what version of Christianity someone told you about, but it is the greatest hookup of all time. And then he goes, and wait a second, you can't earn it. And what in our life can we not earn, right? Like, you can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You can't work for it. I'm going to take your worst, and I'm going to give you my best. And when you're weak, I'm going to be so stinking strong. And, like, this is, the, this is what Jesus gives all of us. And then he, he goes back to heaven. And he says, okay, can we get back to the more? Can we get back to my best? It's actually better than before because in the beginning, I, I walked with you in the garden, but now I get to live with you, inside of you. And then he goes, the same spirit, which the, 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 the same spirit, the, that same power that raised me from the dead lives in you. It's just crazy if you didn't know this. It's kind of crazy stuff. And that word power, it's the dunamis power, which if you were to look it up in the Greek, it's actually the power that resides in armies. It actually means the power that creates wealth. It actually means the power that overcomes sickness. And he goes, hey, that same power. Like, you don't have that same power in the garden. You actually have that power now. It actually lives in you. And then he goes, I'm never going to leave you, and I'm never going to forsake you. I'm never going to walk off. I'm never going to abandon you. I'm going to be with you always. I'm not just the guy that's literally... Uh, on your side, I'm the God that's actually physically right now by your side. And, and then it's like, and then I'm gonna give you my spirit. Sorry, I'm just giving you the whole New Testament in a few minutes. I told you you've been gone forever. He's like, and then I'm gonna give you my spirit. And, and like, no one can know a man's thoughts but a man's spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts but God's spirit. But I've given you my spirit. This is the Bible. You can look it up. So that you can know what I'm gonna give you for free. Yeah. We're hooked up. Yes. So why are we still settling for less? Why are we not living the more? And to make it even clearer, like before he gets this whole wonderful thing that I just laid out going, I hope you know, like, this is how good God is. Like his love's unconditional, he's irrational. He shows up in John 10, 10. He says, I just make my intentions like I did. He said, I want to make my intentions clear with you. The enemy's come to do a couple things. Kill, still, and destroy. But I've come to give you life and give you that life more abundantly. Now, if you don't understand what he's saying, it's, it's, I'll, I'll simplify it. He actually said, I'm coming to give you life, and that word life is simply more. Yeah. Right? Because you didn't have life, you had less. And you now have life, you have more. You got it. It's an intelligent crowd. So because I came to give you life, a.k.a. more, and give you more of the more, more abundantly, which is an adjective for more. So this is how cool Jesus is. He shows up. We've messed it all up. We've missed the mark. We've settled for less. And he goes, I don't care. I've come to give you more and give you more of that more, more often. I've come to give you more, and I just want to give you more of that more, more often. So why are we, thank you, Pastor Diana. You're my favorite. So why are we, why are we settling for less? Why does it not feel like that? Why do we not see what he said we'd see? Why aren't we doing what he said we'd do? He even says, I'm gonna take your cares, cast them on me. He literally goes, hey, don't worry about anything. Like, worry about what you're gonna eat or what you are gonna wear, which is obviously what the Western culture worries about. Like, what are we gonna eat tonight? Susan, what are you wearing? Like, are you, sorry, I don't know why I went into that voice. I don't even do that anywhere. It just came out nowhere. Like, oh my God, where are we going to eat? Are you on social? 
Like, no, I'm like, what are you wearing? I'm wearing a tennis outfit. Come on. Like, well, I, don't, I don't know. I'm sorry. Just erase that from the tapes. Babe, I apologize. I don't know why I did that. I'm like, forgive me. <laughs> Think about it. We spend all our time talking about what we're going to eat and what we're going to wear right. and what we're going to do right. and what's tomorrow going to bring. And he goes, don't do that. I know all that stuff. Like, I, I know all your needs. Just seek me first. Yeah. I'm going to hook all that other stuff up. Like, that's cool. Like, we're good. I'm like, what do you think? I'm going to give you bad stuff. Like, does a bad father, when their kids ask for bread, does he give them a stone? And when they ask for fish, this is Jesus, by the way, give them a snake? No, he goes, bad fathers don't give stones for bread. What do you think I'm gonna do? I'm a good father. I'm the best father. I'm a flawless father. You think I'm gonna give you stones or just bread? No, I'm gonna give you abundance. <laughs> you get the keys up to just help me close. So why are we settling for less? Why do we not see what he said? Can I just be honest? And if we've seen it once, why don't we see it all the time? And the reason why that I'd like us to consider that I'd love us to just do a search through our own hearts and our own souls and our own minds, the reason why is the same reason why Eve settled for less. She was given two options. God said this was the best way. And the enemy said that's not true. And in that moment, she didn't trust God. If you want to know where the state of Christianity is right now in America, around the world, people that believe and don't trust. Can you just be honest? Like where, where your revelation of him runs out is where your distrust in him runs in. And we, we really don't trust him. Hey, I, I'm just going to talk to people that have said yes to Christ. So for those of you who haven't, you got to like a get out of jail free card for this moment. Like those that have actually said yes. You know what we said yes to and how we got there? We believed. We believed that we were going to say a 60 second prayer, maybe a minute, maybe two max with a little seed of faith. And, and this God we haven't seen and we weren't there when he did it is literally eradicating and erasing all of our sins, past, present, and future, away forever to the point that he doesn't remember them. And that we're actually gonna go spend the rest of our life with him in this place we've never, like this is what we believe, right? Like we actually believe, I, I'm gonna get 60 second prayer, I'm gonna have a little seed of faith, I'm truly gonna believe in you, that you are the way, you're, I'm gonna receive your forgiveness, I'm gonna this small little interaction, and then we're gonna go spend eternity forever in this place, your palace called heaven. And like we trust him with our eternity, but not with our earthly. We literally trust him with the infinite, but not with the finite. We literally go, wait, I'm going to magically spend forever with you, but you're not going to feed me tomorrow? I'm going to be with you forever, but you can't figure out my bank account? I, I, like, I'm going to trust you with my forever, but not with my right now? Like, I believe you will redeem this body. I'm going to be in some crazy physical form, and we've all thought about what our heavenly body is going to be like. Everyone did. Like, trust me, I'm going to sing when I get to heaven. I've always wanted to sing. I, I know what I sound like. I can't. Me and my wife always say, when we get to heaven, we're going to sing everywhere. Like Whitney Houston, we're going to go off. <laughs> like, we literally believe that. But then we see someone with a blind eye and go, that's too much. And then we see someone with diagnosed with cancer, like, too much for God. I'm going to spend forever with you in a small little prayer. That's all I, can, can I just tell you guys, what's the greater miracle? The greater miracle is not the dead being raised. The greater miracle is not the blind eyes being opened. The greater miracle is not him giving you the desires of your heart. The greater miracle is not him giving you above and beyond anything you can think, conceive, or imagine. The greater miracle is not you living in the plans he has for you to prosper you and to give you life. The greater miracle is eternity for him and with him forever. But somehow we stop trusting him. And I'll just, I'll be honest with me, guys. I've sold houses, my wife, and we've sold cars, we've moved, we've worked for free. We've done a bunch of stuff that looks like crazy trust. And in this last campaign we did, I found moments, I never thought I would say this. I like never thought I would, like where my, my trust ran out. And I look, like if you look at face value, it's like that guy really trusts God, we really do. But I realized like I was good with a miracle if it was nine days out, but I had a hard time if it was nine hours out. 
Like there was a timeline, there was a part of me that started going, but, but are you coming? But are you gonna show up? But do you care? But are you listening? I found myself, which I feel like I trust him with ever. I've given him everything. Still found myself going, I don't trust you with some things. And the reason why we're not living the more is because we don't trust him. We don't trust them with our finances. We don't tithe or give. We don't trust them with our future. We don't ask them our plans. We don't trust them with romance, our relationships. We date who we want and get married when we want. We don't ask them every single day, how can I help? How do you want me to? We just don't. And you know why we don't trust them? You know, I got, I got these great kids and all of my kids, we have stairs in our house. We have a little spool. It's not a pool. It's a big spa. It's a spool. And it's got a little ledge. And all of my kids from when they were little, I'm just telling you, like I'd sit there at the edge of the stairs or I'd sit there at the edge of the cliff or I'd sit there at the edge of the spool and I would say jump. And every one of my kids, I'm talking from like the littlest age, like in the beginning, they're kind of like, ah. And then they would jump and I'd catch them. Even when you think about a baby walking, like that baby's born with trust. Like you're like, hey, you're gonna make it to me. That baby has no clue. It's like, yeah, you know, it's hitting stuff. It's hitting stuff. And like just keeps coming towards you or my kids keep jumping. You know, my kids right now trust me too much. They'll go up higher and like they're jumping off the balcony. I was like, no, 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 don't trust. Like they're doing trust falls in the house, you know, like randomly. Like, hey, dad, I'm here. Trust fall, you know. Like, and if every one of my kids was here and I was there, if you put something higher and I said jump, not one of them would hesitate. You want to know why? Because I've caught them every time. The reason why you hesitate trusting God is because someone at some point in your journey of life didn't catch you. Let's just be honest. Your reflection on God and lack of trust in God is because humanity has let you down. Whether it was a mom or a dad or a coach or a teacher or a boyfriend or ex-spouse or a, a, a boss or, you know, it's just someone who said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there, but I, I don't show up. I'm going to catch you, but I let you fall. I got your back, but instead I'm going to stab you in the back. We've had moments throughout our journeys where someone said, don't trust again. Don't trust again. Just trust in yourself. And here's what's crazy. We have this crazy after the, all the narrative I built about who God is, still at this journey, even me, we have this crazy propensity to trust ourselves so much and trust God so little. And we continue to bet on ourselves. Like if you leave here tonight and don't choose to trust God, you're choosing to trust yourself. And ourselves are what got us in the mess and got us addicted and, you know, made the mistakes. And, and literally, we like come to the, the table of life again and we're about to gamble and you're like, who's gonna roll the dice? Me or God? Me or God? Well, you're great. You're perfect. You never left. You never failed. You love me so much. You're unconditional. You're like, no one I ever know. You're just the best thing in the world. And then there's me. I've made mistakes. I've messed up. I'm frail. I'm fractured. I'm, I'm faulty. I'm, I'm, I've failed before. And you know, ah, me or God? Me, or me again. Some of you aren't living the more of life because you keep betting on yourself and not betting on God. And here's what's crazy. The world can see it. That one hit me. Because we keep saying, trust God, trust God, trust God. And they're looking at us going, but you don't, you don't, you don't. We keep saying, trust God, but you don't. You don't with your relationship, you don't with your life, you don't with your finances, you don't with your time, you don't with your energy, you don't, you don't. And it's okay that you don't because someone dropped you, but God's not going to. There was a king named Solomon who was the wisest man the Bible says that ever lived. God said, I'll give you whatever you want. And he said, oh, I want wisdom. And Solomon, if you don't know it, he was the wisest, wealthiest king that ever lived. Smarter than Elon Musk. Smarter than Einstein. Whoever you think is the genius of the day. The most brilliant man that ever lived. In Proverbs 3, 5, in the message, he says these words. Think about it. All the intellect. And his response is, trust God from the bottom of your heart. 
Don't try to figure out everything on your own. This is from the most brilliant man that ever lived. He's giving you some advice. He's giving all of us advice. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one that will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God and run from evil. Your body will glow with health and your very bones will vibrate with life. Honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. Your barns were burst and your wine vats were over. Friend, if I could ask you to consider anything tonight, it would be, would you trust him? Would you choose tonight to trust him? And I want you to choose tonight to trust him with that very thing in your head right now, your heart right now, that you know you've not been trusting him with. I'm not asking you to trust him where you've already trusted him, with the eternal. I'm asking you to trust him where you're struggling to trust him, in the temporal. Don't just trust his promise, trust his process. I want to be able to trust him in love and in loss. I want to be able to trust him in death and in life. I want to be able to trust him in good and in bad. I want to trust him with joy and with mourning. I want to trust him with everything and trust him when I have nothing. I want to trust him when everyone knows I should. And I want to trust him when everyone says you shouldn't. I want to trust God when nothing around me says trust Him. The greatest decision you can make of your life to live the life He divinely designed. You trust that He will guide your steps. He knows your minutes, your moments. He's not making a mistake with your life. He's building a masterpiece with it. And He's trusted you. That's why He left and we're here. He just needs a generation of believers to trust him. If I could get heads bowed and eyes closed. You know, if you're here tonight and you're saying, um, said a die, I, I want to trust him with this thing tonight. through your heart and your spirit and say, this is where I've stopped trusting and this is where I don't. With my spouse, with my future, with my finances, with my anxiety, with my issues, I just don't. But you're saying tonight, I am choosing because trust is a choice. Tonight, Jedediah, I'm I'm making a declaration between me and God that I'm going to trust them in this thing I'm not trusting him with. If that's you, would you just stand? If you say, I'm ready to trust him with this thing I've not been trusting him with. let him know this is the thing I'm giving to you. This is the thing I'm, I'm now going to believe. This is the thing I'm not trusting. Come on, if we can come in tight, guys. Come in tight. stood up in something that you've been bowing to and now you're standing against. Just take a moment with God. Have a dialogue. Use your words if you can. Speak from your heart. Speak out loud. Just have a moment with what you're going to give him, what you're going to trust him with. And when you're ready, and you can say it a thousand times, I'm saying it more than ever, just say that those three important words you could say tonight, which is, I trust you that didn't make it in your standing. Even just put your hand on your heart. Maybe just put one hand to heaven. Just take a moment. You might just need to say it over and over again. Like sometimes I'm convincing myself. And he's not 
not judging you, for not trusting you. He's loving you. He knew it. I'm so proud of you right now. See, even as the scripture says, I believe, but help my unbelief. God, I trust you, but help me trust you. Jesus, we trust you. We trust you with our families. We trust you with our lives. We trust you with our breath and with our steps and with our thoughts and with our actions and with our attitudes. We trust you in the unknown. We trust you in the unseen. We trust you when it doesn't make sense. We trust you that this is not it, that this is not all that our lives are going to be. We trust you that we were made for more, more than our friends know, more than our parents said, more than we even understand. You made us for the impossible. team's going to come. We're just going to be a few more minutes. And if there's, and I, and I shared it earlier, if there's, and I don't want to embarrass anyone, that's not my desire, but if you've, and I'll, and I'll make the margins greater, if, if you've been wanting to have a kid and you just want to have a kid and nothing's wrong, or you've been wanting to have a kid and the reports of miscarriage, or there's a doctor's reason why you can't, um, who is that? Who, who, who is that? Who, could you just like shake your hand at me right here, right there? That's awesome. Who is it right here? Your daughter, just quickly, real quick. I just felt God said everyone who can't have a baby is going to have a baby. So who is it over here? That's amazing. Thank you guys for just being bold. Can, can we just get a, like this couple right here? We're praying for your daughter right here. Is there anyone else just quickly? You want to have a baby? So no one knows why you're raising your hand or you want to have a baby, but you, it's been hard and you can't. Anyone else? Anyone else? Right here, right here. Okay, let's just, Father God. Your best friend, great. Let's pray for, like, just let her know. Hey, we, you were talking to about so Let's just pray for these few people. That's awesome. Team's already there. Father God, first of all, we trust you. God, what, regardless of what the doctors have said, regardless of what science has said, we know what you can do. And God, we just thank you for a new life, God. If it's a creative miracle, if it's an issue with a reproductive organ, God, we celebrate new life. God, we celebrate, Lord, these unbelievable, half, half healthy babies that are going to come to these happy homes, Lord, that didn't think was going to happen. God, I thank you that this is going to be the day that we remembered, we prayed, and we trusted, and you answered, and a miracle will be born. Miracles will be born. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Just one more, and this is probably a handful, but how many of you have been like blinding anxiety, like not just a little bit anxious, worry, but I'm talking like blinding Maybe it needs medication, maybe counseling every day, but it's just like an overwhelming, crippling anxiety. It's just, there's hands everywhere. Yeah, that, yeah, there's just hands everywhere. If you're next to someone with your hand right now, thank you, Jesus, right now. God, we thank you, Lord, that one of the greatest gifts you gave us was your peace. Lord, when you ascended to heaven, you said these words, may peace be with you, which means we don't need peace in heaven. You're the prince of it. Peace is a gift you gave to us on this planet. So right now, every mind we speak, peace, be still. All the noise, all the lies, Lord, all the agreements we made with the enemy. Lord, you see the chaos at home. It's been, some, for some of you, it's been an onslaught. Like it's a mental, you're constantly, physically, emotionally exhausted because your mind won't shut off with the negativity. God, we thank you, Lord, that we cast our cares on you. God, we thank you, this is the last minute that this anxiety lives in these lives. This right now is the last minute that anxiety lives in these lives. Just say right where you are, ministry team still praying, and we're gonna have a moment of worship. We're gonna turn over to Pastor Sean. While you're just staying right here, having a conversation with God, if you're here tonight, and you're saying, Je Jedediah, I've actually never trusted Jesus with my life whether you grew up in church or you've never been in an environment like this, but you've never ex received this incredible exchange where he takes your worst and gives you his best, where you say, you know what, my way is not gonna work and I want your way. You've never received it, I would say, this a crazy gift of grace. It's, you can't earn it, you can't deserve it, you can't work for it. But you're here tonight and you're saying, I want Jesus. I want forgiveness. 
I want to live the more of the more of the more you keep talking about. If that's you, would you just pray? In fact, all of us, can we just pray real quick together? Can we say these words, dear Jesus? I need you. I've made mistakes. I've messed up. And I need you in my life. Would you come into my heart today? Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you make me brand new? From this moment on, I'm yours in your mind. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. I trust you. In Jesus' name. Just as we stay in this moment, heads bowed, eyes closed. If that was you, if you said that prayer, you wanted to, you meant it, you needed to, whether you've said it before, but this is a time you're actually recommitting and saying, no, I'm giving it my life again, or you've never said it before, but you're saying, Jedi, this is my night. I needed to say that prayer. I meant it. That prayer was real to me. Would you just raise your hand quickly if that's you? Man, see these hands. See these hands. See these hands. Awesome, man. See these hands going up all over. See these hands. Come on, hands, hands, hands. Anyone else? Just quickly, hand, 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 hand. Over here, so many hands going up. Come on, can we just take a moment to worship? to thank Jesus, to celebrate. <laughs> Would we all stand as we close? I'm gonna tell you what time it is, it's 9.06, and I know some of you have to get up at three in the morning for commute. If you need to leave, feel free. But I wonder, can we sing that song again? And isn't it interesting how he didn't know what I spoke this last weekend and how the Lord is weaving these sermons together in this season of trust. Today, before we leave, let's just make sure we lift up all of our faith to God and we tell him we're speaking the name of Jesus over every area of our life. Can we sing it? I said, can we sing it? Come on, team, lead us out of this.
I thank you right now that we're stepping into a new season as a church. You've been preparing us for this moment all year long. That Lord, <laughs> what could you do with a church that trusts you? I pray in the name of Jesus that you would take us into every part of the world. Take the album, take our gifts, take our finances, take our, our, our hearts, our stories, and use them to reach more people with your love. Do the extravagant through us. We trust you because we know you're in control. Ah. Lord, we bless you and we love you and we thank you for creative miracles beginning to take place even now. In the name that is above every name, somebody say Jesus. <laughs> we trust you, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Come on, clap your hands one more time and say a good amen. <laughs> we give all glory to God, but we have no problem honoring someone who has carried the word of God like he did. Can we clap our hands for Jedediah tonight? We love him so much. Now you know what our phone calls are like. I mean, I can't even get a word in. He just, he does that for an hour. And I'm just like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's good, Jed. It's real good. I do love that guy. He, he elevates my faith every time I talk to him. Are you excited for this Sunday? All right, look. You guys that come on Wednesday night, you're the hungry ones. Revival is God's response to hunger. So bring this hunger on Sunday and uh, let's see what God does. If you want to give today, some of you, it's a, it's a trust issue even with the tithe. We never tell people to give. We simply say, pray, ask God what you should do. Maybe this is an area to start just to let them know, God, I'm going to trust you in this area. But even more than that, it's making a difference in people's lives. Um, I want you to pray. I'm not saying this to the church on Sunday, but just pray. Uh, we have, we found, don't scream, but we found a warehouse. I said don't scream, but you did, you can't help it. But we wrote, we wrote an offer, and I don't know what's going to happen, guys. So it may go through, it may not go through, but here's what I learned tonight. I trust him. It's a warehouse. It's a, it's a warehouse that would enable us to receive all of these goods from Amazon and Costco and and then give this stuff away through other, partner with other churches and they would go be the heroes to their local communities and, and it would just be a lot of good in the Bay Area. So I think it's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. It's gonna take a lot of finances to resource this, but I think it's gonna bless a lot of people too. So would you just pray with me? Don't tell Sunday, this is, this is Wednesday night talk. Don't tell Sunday. But I do love you, and as we give today, you are making an incredible difference. There's a few ways you can give, and uh, if you have not been through Growth Track yet, make sure you trust God with your time and your gifts, and everything that God gives you, He wants to give to somebody else through you. Amen? I love you. Go in His peace. Go get your kids immediately. Don't talk to anybody. Go get your kids, and then talk. I love you. We'll see you Sunday morning. Come on, sing it.